what's interesting is everyone is always thinking about making money, but we're not focused on where are we losing money. And then also it's about trying, so, you know, preserving our wealth as well as creating an infrastructure around our wealth. If you're a real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show is for you. Learn secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field who will guide you on your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so you can take your commissions and turn them into cash flow. Here's your host, Randall. Let's dive in. Hey, welcome back. Today's guest is Dave Wolcott. He's the founder and CEO of Pantheon Investments. They are like a fund of funds where they will raise capital with their LPs and then they'll find great operators and partner with them and then invest their capital into those deals, whether it's oil and gas, multifamily, real estate, or, or right now they have a like a debt fund or an income fund. And, and so very interesting strategy. We talk about his book, The Holistic Wealth Strategy, and he has you know five, five principles on, on growing your wealth. And it's a great conversation. I learned a lot. He's, he's definitely knowledgeable and knows what he's talking about. So I think you're going to get a lot out of the show. If you would go on, rate, and review, it helps us a ton bring on awesome guests. Really appreciate it. And let's dive into the conversation. All right, Dave, welcome to the show. It's good to have you on. I'm excited for the conversation because I was reading through your book, The Holistic Wealth Strategy, and I saw that you have a five-phase approach to building wealth. And so I wonder if we could start there and kind of talk about that and um, what those steps are. And if you could just high level those for the listeners. Yeah, absolutely, Randall. First of all, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Grateful to connect with you and your audience. And maybe just to provide a little context, right, before we kind of jump into that, you know, uh, just a little bit on my background. I was raised in a middle, middle class family. I was told that the recipe for success was go to school, get good grades. You know, you're going to get a job. And then that was it, right? That was the plan. So I went to college, then had the opportunity to go into the Marine Corps and served over there for four years, did some amazing things and got to learn things they don't teach you anywhere else, things such as team, like teamwork, leadership, and integrity. And then after I transitioned into the tech industry, got into corporate America, started doing that. And at the same time, uh, my wife and I started raising a family. So we had an 18-month-old running around, and then on October 24th, 2000, we literally had triplets and quadrupled the size of our family. So I can tell you, Randall, like the first thing that was going through my mind, um, it was, you know, really crazy, was just, you know, man, how am I going to provide for financial security for my family? Because the goalpost just got moved way down the field, you know, and I went to see my financial planner, right, was the first thing that I did. And he just told me the same thing that everyone else says is, oh, you can max out your 401k. They have 529 plans for your kids, you know, defer your taxes and all these things. And it was right at that moment that I realized, you know what, you know, the wealthy are not building wealth as retail investors in the stock market. There's got to be a better way. So I kind of launched this obsessive journey to figure out how the top 1% are really building their wealth. And so I spent 20 years after that investing in, on the real estate side, I invested in raw land, retail, single family, multifamily. I even did flipping, land flipping. Also invested in oil and gas. And so all kinds of alternative assets over the 20 years. And then also figured out some other things along the way, some advanced, I would say, you know, wealth strategies that, that really people just don't teach, you know, anywhere else. So fast forward to 20 years later, and I wrote the book, The Holistic Wealth Strategy to really help other people, you know, really kind of have a blueprint or system, if you will, of how to actually build, you know, I would call legacy wealth and think like the ultra wealthy or like family offices do, you know, even if your net worth isn't at a hundred million and it's at 4 million, you can still think and act this way and actually grow, you know, much quicker. All right. So let's, can we touch on those then? What are, what is, yeah. what's okay. So we'll jump into it. So, yeah. so it's all really underpinned by getting crystal clear clarity 
on your wealth vision. So what does that actually mean, mean to you? And I love to ask the question of people, you know, if, if you had a billion dollars today, what would you be doing? Where would you be? And who would you be with? You know, and, and just really, you know, having that clarity of what that is, because if you don't have a target, you're going to miss every time, right? So, so getting that vision is really underpinning the entire framework. And then phase one, we move into is mindset, right? I'm sure you've gone to, you know, family events or outings and you start talking about real estate and I'm investing in this. And what do they, what do a lot of people say? That sounds risky to me, right? My financial advisor says it's a bad idea. Well, you have to start asking questions for yourself and see if it makes sense. Like, does deferring taxes really make sense, right? And I think you need to have the right mindset. You need to be really a lifelong learner. You need to be asking questions. And then you need to start working on goals and habits that really support that vision. So it really all starts with mindset is number one. And then the second one is really moving into, I, I would call really an equation around your wealth, right? That your net worth is actually equal to your relationship capital plus your physical capital. And those things can really help drive, you know, your net worth, not just you know, the amount of money you have. And right. So as an example, I, I was just on another interview with a, a gentleman who I'd met actually in the early 2000s who got me into, frankly, into my first, you know, multifamily deal. And this is back in 2000, right? When there weren't all that many opportunities that were really available, right? So working on things, you know, such as relationship capital, are super important. Also working on physical capital. So I think about your health, you know, Steve Jobs had all the money in the world, mm -hmm. but he actually did, he didn't have his health, right? And so what he would he have paid to actually, you know, you know, solve his health problems. He would have paid anything, but he couldn't buy one more day, right? So I think it's it's really important uh, to have that. And then we also talk about your financial IQ as well, right? So starting to learn that there are different asset classes, real estate, alternative assets, also different types of strategies, right? I think a lot of people think typically in a linear fashion, they're always thinking like, well, what's the return level on this? How, how can I maybe outperform that? But we try to encourage think um, investors to be thinking about exponential type thinking where you can do strategy stacking and really get, you know, real multipliers. So I think, you know, improving your financial IQ is really key as well. Awesome. Okay. You mentioned that you have, have invested across a number of asset classes before we dive much deeper than, than, than this, what, what is, what's your favorite asset class from the last 20 years of investing? What, what are, what are you most jazzed up about right now? Uh, to, you know, I guess I would say I, d I don't really have a favorite one, you know, and I think, you know, when it comes to portfolio allocation, so I've had Michael Sonnenfeld on my podcast, you know, who's the founder of Tiger 21, we talked about asset allocation. And, you know, we kind of have this model inside of our mastermind that we talk about basically purpose driven asset allocation, right? So oftentimes investors can say, Hey, I go, I went and I invested in this deal because my friend said it was a great deal, you know, or this one's got a certain IRR or certain cash flow to it. But in reality, people haven't really thought through what are what is their actual buy box? What is your strike zone based on your goals? And again, that vision. Mm -hmm. So is it a cash flow vision where maybe you want your spouse to be able to stay home with the kids? you know, within the next five years. So it's a cash flow goal and it's a, you know, you've got a date in mind and you're working really hard to that. Or, you know, you might be younger and you have a growth goal, right? Like, I mean, you know, we we just did a really unique real estate project, which was a build to rent condo building in South Florida. And it's had over a 3X multiple in four years, right? But total growth play. 
you know, no, no cash flow on it, right? So it kind of depends on the goals and things that you're looking for. We also love the energy sector because it's got great income to it, but you can also offset active income through the taxes. A hundred percent of your investment can offset, um, you know, your W-2 taxes, which is huge for a lot of our high income investors, right? Looking for those kind of opportunities. Yeah. So, so I think really understanding, you know, your, your vision and then creating your buy box is the most important thing an investor can do. And then start to look for those opportunities that are then going to fit into it. Yeah. I'll give you another example as well. We have um, private credit is another big asset class that we're in. A lot of billionaires have been kind of going after this asset class right now because it's basically alternative lending. So we're providing lending or factoring really to small businesses who need capital, taking advantage of the banking industry that hasn't, you know, they've got tighter requirements that haven't been able to lend. But we get really strong double digit returns that are coming in on this. It's non-correlated to the markets. It doesn't have interest rate risk exposure. Um, you're also diversified across 15 different industries. Um, so it's got a really nice uh, profile to it if you're looking for uh, you know, cash flow. And that's like a straight debt fund, income fund that you guys set up? Yeah, it's it is an income, and we do have some uh, growth uh, associated with it. You know, depending on when you want to take your distributions, either quarterly, annually, or at the end of the term, right? And then you have a, a coinciding return profile that that increases the longer your hold yep. is. So, how much of your day to day is acting as almost like a financial planner for your your clients? And then the other half is going out, actually finding the assets or finding the the sponsors to work with, like it, because it's yeah, it's 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 probably it's probably split, Randall. You know, because we are. I really like to think about. I really like to break down. You know what e wealth even means to people, mm -hmm. right? And think about the psychology of it. And then as you start to understand the psychology, you can understand what people's needs are. Or what's really driving their motivations. And again, try to help to, you know, create alignment and what their investment strategy might look like, understand their risk pro profile, you know, and get that alignment in place. Yeah. And then, you know, the other half of the time, you know, we, we spend actually creating relationships uh, in the marketplace. We have I believe a nice sweet spot with our relationship base, you know, right under the institutional level, but also working with operators that are very seasoned, their institutional quality and nature, but they don't have all all of the fees and, you know, the bureaucracy, right, that the institutions do. So we're we spend a lot of time deal sourcing, trying to find great deals, and then also, you know, educating our investors. How how do you find a, um, I guess, a balance on the inflow of potential limited partners or past partners that you're working with to the number of offerings you have at any given time? Like, are you closing one out before you have another? Mm -hmm. I'm just always curious about that type of structure. Yeah, in some cases, in some cases, no. Like our private credit fund, for instance, is open for the rest of the year. We just launched that, yeah. so we have we have enough room on that but it is it's a constant kind of you know supply and demand battle in terms of getting access to great opportunities then having enough allocation to be able to support that opportunity you know and then do you have the investor demand to actually fit that and again it all depends on what investors appetites are and what they're looking for but we do regular surveys with our investors so we really keep the pulse of you know what their needs are what they're looking for you know right now you know at this point in time most of our investors are looking for cash flow that's the that is the primary dimension that they're looking for with investment opportunities and probably some of the reason is you know a lot of the you know real estate has been challenged as you know with the interest rates so a lot of operators have paused some distributions cash flow might be light there so finding some alternative options to fill that void, I think is is uh, is paramount okay. right now. So with that in mind, 
you're obviously providing a cash flow vehicle with your with your debt fund with with the income fund that you guys have. What is that investing in? What is the primary you know, like driver of the cash flow that is allowing that to return that type of yeah return. so there are actually merchant cash advances so it's private credit it's actually a, you know a level up really from debt on the return stack so i mean we're seeing you know returns from 12 to uh, on the low side if you're taking the quarterly distributions you know up to above in the 20s on the on the growth side of it and what what the model is is that Let's say you have a, a restaurant owner in your town and he's got two locations. They're doing great. They've been in business for you know nine years, great track record, always full, doing well. Well, they want to expand to the third location. If they go to the bank to get capital, the bank might turn down in the underwriting because he doesn't have a college degree or the credit rating isn't so great. So therefore, we can provide the funding and do underwriting like inside of a week. There's a super rigorous process around, you know, doing that underwriting, actually give him the funding. And then he's able to, you know, put that new restaurant in place. And then we actually start taking on the receivables. Like literally when there's credit card swipes, we're the first to get paid mm -hmm. principal and interest payments on a daily and weekly basis. Yeah. So this thing really, the cash flow comes in really quickly and, you know, and, and the business owner is happy. It's all, you know, similar to real estate where you're looking for hard money lending. It's a, it's a little similar, right? To the business side of things, right? You're paying a premium for that capital, but now he just put in a new, whole new revenue source, which he pays off the loan. And now he's got that, you know, new income stream what, going. What is the, what's the recourse on that? He, he stands up a third location, location flops. Yeah. That, well, th this is what's great about this, Randall. There, I mean, you know, this, there's higher, you know, a higher risk profile than senior debt. But it's quite low. So after the past six years, this platform that we're working with has had an average default rate of only 6%, right? And we also collateralize the majority of the loans through personal guarantees by the business owners, or if they have equipment, things like that, that we'll always you know try to look to put collateral in place. And then- we actually further diversify in two more layers, which is one, like I mentioned, that we never just say invest all in one sector, like in leisure. You know, we're in hospitality, we're in transportation, we're in, you know, retail, we're in restaurants, we're in real estate, right? At all of these different levels. And then secondly, we only take, you know, just no more than a 5% position on any one of these given loans. So therefore it really reduces our, those defaults, yeah. right? That could come in or our exposure to that. Yeah. Are, are you saying you Pantheon only takes a 5% position on the loans that the correct. operator is, yeah, correct. is loaning? Okay. Correct. Got it. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's an interesting business model. When I was learning about funds in general, one of the guys was doing something very similar, just standing short-term loans. Like, I don't know how, how long are those loans typically? Seven months is yeah. the average. Yeah, yeah. that's solid. Yeah, because then you can turn. Yeah, it so twice. so you add velocity yeah. exactly. You keep turning that capital, you know, and um, you know the other thing I think that people don't realize is this industry over the tap, top past ten years. I mean, it started out of nothing. It started with zero, and it's been growing at a twenty percent annualized rate. Yeah, right. So the need for this alternative lending, you know, just continues to accelerate. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Okay, I want to get back. Kind of, kind of went down a, a rabbit hole. Wanted to ask you about some fun stuff that you got working. Yeah. Um, but in general, on the on the blueprint side of things, the 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 crux of the of the book is again setting so mindset, finding out the mindset. Is this on the uh, again your your way of investing and your way of speaking to your potential limited partners and current limited partners? It is mindset. Let's figure out the equation of where you want to live in this risk reward what what kind of capital you have is is that am i understanding that properly yeah so so why don't i kind of summarize and we had only yep. gone through the first Correct. two phases so 
So phase one was the mindset. You know, first of all, you need to be open minded. This isn't for everyone, right? Not 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 if you if you're happy with your W two job and investing in your four hundred one k and your financial planner, then that's great, right? But if you're looking to really figure out how the ultra wealthy, you know, are becoming decamillionaires and centimillionaires. This is a good framework for that. So you have to have the right mindset, right? And constantly be developing that. You know, I spend over six figures a year on my mindset, right? A investing in myself. Phase two was building out your financial IQ, your mindset IQ, and your health IQ, and the relationship IQ, right? So getting those all in place. And then in phase three, what's interesting is everyone is always thinking about making money, but we're not focused on where are we losing money. And then also it's about trying, so, you know, preserving our wealth as well as creating an infrastructure around our wealth. And so what I mean by that is taxes, for instance, whether you're a business owner or an individual investor, taxes are your number one biggest expense on your line item. So do you have a proactive tax strategy and a team that you're working on regularly to reduce your taxes? You know, I was able to last, last year, my marginal effective rate was 4%, right? But that wasn't by accident, right? It's because of, you know, how I'm conducting things, how, how I how I operate my business, how I operate my personal life, right? So trying to reduce your taxes, I think is the biggest opportunity for investors out there, right? Because it's your number one biggest expense. There's also something your listeners are probably familiar with is the cash value whole life insurance or infinite banking, which is just such a great way to create certainty and a world of uncertainty right? By taking some of your capital, positioning it into life insurance. And then like I was talking about before, having this exponential multiplier, right? Because you put this capital in this vehicle, it compounds tax-free. You can give it to your heirs tax-free. You can create basically a reverse income stream in retirement that's tax-free because you're taking loans against it. It also has asset protection in it, so it's safer than your stocks or your house or things like that. And then the coolest thing is you can actually borrow money against it. So this is where I keep my, you know, rainy day fund, right, which is, you know, one to three years of, of operating capital for my family. So I can sleep at night regardless of what cycle we're in or what can happen this is the place I store it. And if I don't need it, that's great because it's growing at a 6%, you know, compounding tax-free loan. And I know that even at age 110, my wife is going to be able to get tax-free income every month, right? Very simply, it's just going to kind of come off. So that's a, a huge strategy we like to help our clients with. And it works so well with real estate and some of this other investing, because the idea is that as you have all these multiple passive income streams, take that income and, you know, you might have a grand here, a grand there. We'll dump it all right back into the policy. So now you're adding the velocity to it. Now it's growing at 6% until you get your next tranche for 50 grand, 100 grand, whatever it is to go invest into that next opportunity. So, it, and you're taking over that banking function. And so, you know, Again, it's a great, great strategy that a lot of family offices uh, use. Yeah, so. we've, we've, um, I, I've definitely read about it. We haven't done that, but it is, it's something that's like in the forefront. I want to ask, when is that typically, like, who is that good for? It, it can't be good for the new person who's just getting into real estate or doesn't have a, a, a chunk of cash to put towards the first premium or, right? Or am I wrong? So, you, so look, Randall, yeah, I got to tell you, I mean, this is an amazing strategy. And I find that often a lot of times people are missing it at different stages in life. But let me give you an example. My oldest daughter is 25. She started a small policy when she was in college, made some money over the summers and was like, where do I put it? You know, in the bank account. No, we're going to set up a policy for you. 
She put it in the policy. It was growing at just about a 6% rate, like through college. She graduated college. Her and her boyfriend bought a single family house in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they got the down payment for the house from the policy. So they borrowed against the policy. There's the down payment. They spent about 18 months in the house, house hacking it, renovating it, building it up, built over 100K in equity. And then they actually borrowed from the policy again to go buy their second house. And now they're cash flowing the first house. And then all the cash flow from that first house goes right back into the policy to recycle it so they can go do it again. So 25 years old, I mean, just think about, for, you know, number one, being able to come up with the down payment, right? And then having that, you know, liquidity, right? And flexibility to manage that. So again, this is, let, let's see, break that down a little bit more. Okay. So how much, how much did she start with? And when you're, when you're putting money into it on a consistent basis, I'm putting a hundred. Hers was 10 K, okay. you know, I think you want to maybe the smallest amount, maybe 10 K a year, but you can structure these different ways. You could have a liquidity event mm -hmm. and, you know, fund something right with more of a lump sum up front yep. with paid up additions, you know, or you can do, if you've got a longer time horizon, but like my kids, you know, we've set those up with about 10 K. Yep a year. And then every time you have a liquidity event, you just fund it and then borrow it out again and then go invest in your next deal. I guess what I'm getting at is how much how much is going towards premiums and how much is actually going toward you your your cash value. Cash yeah, so typically in these the the premium structure is in the first, you know, 2 to 3 years is where your cost load is like could be 25 to 30% to actually pay for the insurance. Yeah. And then, you know, hit this break even point and then it's all about the future growth. I mean, this is definitely, you know, a long-term strategic play that you want to have, but you know, the, the good thing is like, let's say you even did have say a down year in terms of cash flow, you can actually pay the premium with borrowing money from the policy, yep. you know, so there is some flexibility yeah. there. And then one more thing on this before we move on. You you have a let's say you have a hundred thousand dollars available uh, that you can draw as a loan, and you're getting a typical six percent rate of return. When you borrow that money, how much is that costing you? What's the is is the rate higher or lower than what you're? It's always it's always lower. Okay. There's always some type of spread anywhere from like a half point to a point, yeah. you know, depending on interest rate environments. Yeah. But it it'll always be lower. So yeah. so your money that so are you borrowing hundred thousand? You're still getting. 6% on that money as if it was still in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that the it's uninterrupted the total cash value of the policy yeah. is always uninterrupted so that's, you know, regardless of what you're lending on. Okay. That's that's where it becomes really powerful. Okay, I got you. Yeah, when you when you look at the 20, 30 year compounding with tax free, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that 6% is more like, say, 9%, yeah. you know? And which, uh, is, is it like a, an IRA where if she sells that asset, then she has to dump all that 100, you said she had 100,000 equity. Does she have to dump that back into the policy for it to stay? No, no. I mean, that that's, you know, that's equity that she earned, okay. right? So, yeah, yeah. you know, when, when they sell the house. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay, really interesting. All right, so we've gone through, I think, three of the five preservation of, of wealth and you know, creating that infrastructure. Are there two more? Yeah, two more. Yeah. So number four, this is when it starts to get fun, right? So number four is asset repositioning. Okay. And, you know, over 90% of Americans really have their money in two places. It's in trapped equity in their primary residence, or it's in government-sponsored qualified plans like IRAs, 401ks, and things like that. So- you know, I actually, on the IRA standpoint, 401k, I mean, 10 years ago, I was so bullish on the strategy and the investments and the track record that we were performing. I, I literally paid the penalty. I paid the taxes and exited the 401k. And since then I've like tripled the money, mm -hmm. right? 
So, but I think a lot of people like who would ever even think about that? Yeah. They, you know, people are like, oh, I'm not going to pay the penalty. Well, here's what happens in reality. And we actually built this for investors, which is really cool. We built a calculator. Okay, let's just look at it objectively. So if I take 100K uh, from the 401K, I paid 10% penalty. And let's say I pay 35% taxes. So now you have a net investable 55 grand. Okay. And then you put that into multifamily assets, whatever you want. But we could assume, let's say, a rate of return of 20%, or you can even model it to what you like. But let's say 20%, because that's what we've seen with depreciation and tax benefits. You know, that amount grows to over two and a half million over 20 years. That same amount, had we left the 100K in the 401K, it would only be about 260 grand at the end of 20 years. And that's also before taxes, fees, and inflation. So I encourage people to, you know, really take a look at the numbers there. Obviously, it's not for everyone. There's some different risk, but you know, think about some things like that. Yes, you could do a self-directed IRA and get exposure to some of these assets, but you know, taking back control, right, of money that is yours, you know, rather than having the government tell you how much you can take out, when you can take it out, is really powerful. So that's one thing. And then again, you know, if you have equity trapped in your primary residence. Look, the rate of return is zero on equity in your house. Man, I just talked to an investor the other day. He just purchased a new $2 million house. They paid cash for the house and they feel great because they don't have a mortgage and they have a great new house. But after you model out what we could do with borrowing money from the bank, even at today's rates of six, 7%, and then investing that somewhere else at 20%, right? I mean, can do a lot, not to mention the tax deductions and all those other things. So I think asset repositioning is really key for people to look at their existing portfolio and say, how can I really optimize what I have? Because most people have a lot of low hanging fruit. So that's, that's phase number four. Yeah. Just on, on that point and on that strategy, what, when you talk about uh, I, I guess mindset again, this goes back to number one it, it, somebody that pays 2 million cash for a house, there's no risk, right? They have zero risk now on that property other than taxes. If they go and mortgage that property, now they have increased their risk slightly with that. And then they have a further risk if they don't put that money to work. If they are paying 7% on that million dollars, say they do 50% mortgage and they don't put that money to work. I mean, now they're the, the kind of, Screw the pooch, I guess, is the it's like you need to go. Well, put well that it's money interesting. To work, so. Well, it's interesting, Randall, because you know, you you just talked about risk, right? And this is the blind spot that he didn't really see. Did he have no risk? Actually, I would tell you that he completely increased his risk exposure because he's a business owner. And the first thing a creditor is gonna do if you get into a lawsuit is they're gonna go after your house or any marketable securities that you have, right? Since the house is a hundred, it's all equity in there, they're gonna go after that. Now, if I'm levered up, let's say 80%, the bank actually had, is take, taking on that risk, right? Yeah. So you actually reduce your risk by having the bank hold the note on the house, right? And then the other layer in there, and again, this ties to the exponential thinking, is think about all the extra interest, you know, uh, mortgage interest deduction that we can get by having a mortgage on it, right? Yeah. So, you know, so that's pretty powerful. And you can convert that trapped equity into like, let's say we put it into that credit fund you know, that's lower risk paying 15%, you arbitrage that and now you're making, you know, seven, eight percent return out of like nothing, yeah. right? Just by being smarter. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it makes sense. Again, you just have to have that money working and put it to work. Yeah. Otherwise it's yeah. it's kind of a waste. Okay, so that's, that's for asset repositioning and taking advantage of trapped equity. What's number five? Yeah, and the last one is all about building massive passive income. 
So what we want to do is be looking for, you know, these different assets. We talked about building your own strike zone and what, you know, what really looks good for you from an investment thesis standpoint, what type of assets do you want to be in that are creating multiple passive income streams so you don't have too much dependency, you know, in any given asset class, in any given asset. You know, you've got diversity between different operators, different markets, different return profiles, right? And then again, all things that are supporting your vision statement. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to do a quick like strategy session with you then. So you have, you have somebody who comes to you and they say, look, I, I'm looking for a balance between, you know, tax, cash flow, and wealth generation over the next five to 10 years. I've got half a million dollars to put towards something like what, what are, what are your recommendations for someone in that? And and maybe you have to get a little bit deeper, but just on a high level, yeah. like what is the, just what's your need overall? Yeah. yeah. Just high level things I would think about. So one thing I would, I would set up the, you know, cash value, whole life insurance policy, right? Because that's, I could take some of that money, deploy that into that, build that asset, create that certainty. And again, then I can borrow against it, you know, at a future time. The other thing that's really important with that is, I mean, how many times, let's say we have a liquidity event or you, I just sold my business and now I have 500K. Mm -hmm. Well, like you, have, you kind of have this money burning a hole in your pocket type of mentality, right? But, you know, you need to be a prudent investor and strike when the timing is right. So if you immediately put it to work, where you have control over it, then you can say, I could take 500K and I can stretch it out for the next five years and say, hey, I'm going to deploy 100K a year, right, into different assets as I find opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So it gives you some flexibility. So that, that would be definitely one option uh, or one thing that I would put in place for sure. I would also look at, again, depending on your income, we really like the energy sector, we have an oil and gas opportunity that's coming out here shortly. It's return of capital within the first three to five years. Very strong institutional quality. It's non-energy. Oil and gas is non-correlated to the markets. You're hedging inflation, you know, and you have exposure to a commodity that I don't care where you work in the world, what industry you're in, where you live, but the need and the demand for energy just keeps growing, right? So we'd like to have some exposure there. I would look at definitely look at cash flow as well, right? Any kind of cash flow opportunities like the the private credit that we're in are great. Real estate, of course, is awesome, right? If you can get if you can get that three dimensional return profile where you can reduce your taxes, you can get some cash flow and you can get some upside growth, right? That's really the trifecta, but it's been harder, obviously, in this market, you know, to f identify great deals. So, yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah. was going to ask you about the, um, the just in general, I was looking at some of the opportunities you guys have and some of the assets you guys are in. Um, have you guys shifted away from multifamily in general and, and more focused on maybe storage or any, I'm specifically real estate, I would say, or are you guys out of real estate? Yeah, we probably, we probably see a dozen multifamily deals like a week. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we get a lot of deal flow coming across our desk and we've said no we've said no to everything because yeah. we still think we still think assets are overvalued right now, you know, generally speaking. It's really all about the debt, but I think there's some unique opportunities like I, I had talked about earlier that, you know, one we did in South Florida, we partnered with a developer and a family office to build this build to rent condominium building uh, that's a really unique product, really unique, you know, market dynamics where you have a lot of buyers coming from Central and South America that want to invest in the U.S. and cash, you know, put their, their cash buyers and put their capital in the U.S., right? Because it's more stable. So, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? So we're always looking for, you know, unique kind of opportunities there in the real estate uh, space. So, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say we're, we're definitely real estate is, is a core focus, but it's all about finding the right operators and the right deals. Yeah, for sure. For sure. 
you mentioned when we first started going about you spend a decent chunk of money on your mindset and I think it's important. And, and, and so I'd be very curious to know what you think is, is, is worth spending your money on programs or what you do in order to make sure that your mindset is in the right place for you, for you and your investment. Yeah. So great question. And, you know, this is how I would really articulate this, Randall, is that your number one asset is you. And I've always gotten at least a 10x or 100x return when I invest in myself. So when I invest in my health, when I invest in my relationships, when I let invest in my mindset, right, is all really critical. So I'm a member of some, you know, very high level entrepreneurial groups, uh, coaching groups, relationship capital kind of, you know, mastermind groups yep. as well. But I also, you know, what's interesting as well is, you know, if you make the investment for one of these things, don't show up and expect, hey, when am I going to get my ROI? When am I going to make, you know, money back? I would pose that you actually show up and say, how much can I give to this community, right? How much can I help other people? Because when you can make that shift and start helping other people, it's like the famous quote from Zig Ziglar, right? If you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want. So show up and be an active member, you know, participate in these communities. We have a mastermind community and I've just seen some explosive growth from people and how they, how they think about things now, the relationships that they've created, the strategies that they've learned, the connections that they've made, you know, which are all really invaluable. So for sure. Well, I think that's a great spot to leave it on because it, very well said. And yeah, invest in yourself. I agree with you. You're going to get a lot more out of it than you put into as, as far as dollar value goes. So again, Dave, I appreciate you jumping on. I'm going to share all your contact information in the show notes. If you're looking for and investment, I highly recommend you jump on and, and take a look at some of the offerings that you guys have and uh, reach out to Dave and his team if you guys are looking for that. Yeah, I'd also be happy, Randall, if uh, anyone's interested in learning more about the Holistic Wealth Strategy, you can get a free copy of the book if you go to holisticwealthstrategy.com. Perfect. I appreciate that. All right, guys, we'll catch you on the next episode. Did you know that 80% of the agents we speak with got into real estate in order to gain passive income so they could obtain financial freedom and become work optional? If you want to stay up to date, the best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. We'll catch you on the next episode.